Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I am your host, and I'm very pleased to welcome my next guest, Rick Thomas. He is the president of Rick Thomas Yachting Development, executive board member of the International Super Yacht Society, president of JMS Yachting in the past, and so much more. Tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome. Wow, thanks, Ray. I appreciate you having me here this morning, this afternoon. We're on two sides of the ocean right now. Um, cool. It's uh, nice to have a conversation. So you ask the question, and I always tell people, be careful if you put a microphone in my hand because you just don't know what you're going to get. Um, I've been in the marine industry almost my entire life. I literally was building docks at 16 and 17 years old. I learned to weld when I was 16 years old, working in the back of my dad's shop, making davits for private residences to push, hang your boats behind your house, which is a thing here in Florida. Um, I went to a Florida Institute of Technology, got a degree in underwater technology, and went out to the Gulf of Mexico, and I worked for four years as a commercial diver, hard hat diver, laying pipelines and being involved in oil exploration and oil production. And in 1986, I got this great idea to start building sailboat davits out of my dad's shop back in Florida. I left the diving industry and started working for the likes of Charlie Morgan and Ted Irwin and some of the sailing yacht guys that we have here in the States. And that evolved into a company called Nautical Structures, which has been in the industry now for 30, it's on its 38th year. I left Nautical Structures two years ago. Uh, I um, was uh, asked to start a yacht management company here in the States, uh, working with um, Frank Jansen and, and uh, Sam Thompson of JMS Yachting in Monaco. And we set up an office. Um, I built a brand and um, hired people and brought in a fleet uh, in my tenure of a total of nine yachts and built a profitable company. I left them first part of November, right after Fort Leonard of Book Shell, because I really needed this time for myself, the sabbatical I'm enjoying right now. And I really saw, I see some real opportunities in this industry being untouched, unresolved. And I'm focused on starting something new that will really attend to uh, a number of things, both related to owner experience as well as crew experience. That's the, that's the, the short version. Tell me a little bit about about that, what are you seeing as lacking within the industry and, and what do you hope to achieve when it comes to owner and crew? So I'm touch on the owner first. That's almost, that's the easiest one maybe. And I'll, I'll start out by saying that there are two elements in our industry that are essential. You take out either of these elements, you don't have an industry. Owner and crew. Everything between is the fluffy stuff that makes up the rest of the industry. But you take out the owners, the boats are buying boats. You take out the crew, the boats are stuck to the dock. They can't go anywhere. It can't be maintained. They'll sink. So you got to have the two. Owners, I have seen them maligned and disrespected and basically used as a source of income and kind of fire and forget. I've talked to so many owners that wonder why they feel like they're so disrespected by the industry that they support with their money and their passion. and. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on what I'll call a yachting concierge management program that would involve working with the brokers, the builders in the transition of bringing the boat that's been sold to this owner to the owner, making sure well, this is for something as small as a 15 meter boat to as big as a 115 meter boat. It is the same thing applies. Um, so taking them through all the pre-purchase parts and making sure that their expectations are set, that we understand the owner's culture and expectation of how the boats can be used, operated, where, when, charter, private yacht, limited charter, whatever that might be. That's its own piece of the business. And I completely affirm that if you take care of these guys and gals that are spending their wealth to build these boats and, and, and support our industry, We'll grow our industry. We'll keep them. We'll retain them. They'll they'll become more involved in helping our industry improve. The other side of that coin is the crew, and right, we don't have enough time to really get into 
all of that. But I will tell you that the business that I'm developing right now is going to be focused on what I'll call compassionate crew management. Taking what has currently been considered crew management, which really is the monetization of crew, placing them on the boats, replacing them on the boats, moving them around, whatever that looks like, and reinventing how that's done to the best of our ability to create a better working environment, better contracts, a standardized SCA agreement that hopefully we can get the whole industry to, to, to step up to. It can go on and on, but the starting point is identifying that there's a real issue in in the crew space in our industry and finding ways that we can, I don't want to use, I'm not sure the word organic is the right word, but compassionately, organically improve it, change it, move the culture to something that's better. Let me ask you, do you think that some of the things that create this dissatisfaction with the owners and of course the dissatisfaction that we are obviously seeing with crew is that fluff in the middle as you so call it yeah because the listen coming from a position where i spent so many years of my career building equipment and providing services to support these yachts and coming into contact with crew casually on and off you don't, if you're in this industry, and if you're not hands-on working with these boats day to day, you don't understand what the crew is really doing and their role and what that looks like. It, it, good crew just makes it look easy and seamless. And bad crew looks like there's just a constant shit show going on. And then they make Bravo shows about that to show what that shit show looks like to the rest of the world. I said it. But in between all of that, you have got the management companies, you got the brokerage houses, you got the charter business, the charter brokers, charter managers, port control, everybody that's involved in supporting these vessels are dealing with the crew and they see firsthand the good programs, they see the bad programs, they hear the stories, they're sitting in the bars in the evening talking to crew that's just come off a boat or on rotation or just got a little bit of leave on their hands. They, so then you start picking up on what is really happening and you realize, you mean there's actually suicides going on? You never hear about that. They try to keep that pretty quiet, don't they? The drug abuse, the sexual abuse, the bullying, it's, it's everywhere. And listen, there's no Pollyanna part of my view. That kind of stuff happens in other industries and other places, but I dare you to take that same demographic and stick them into a boat where you've got people from eight different nations and different cultures and religious backgrounds and social backgrounds. And these are by and large attractive young people that are coming together for the first time and they don't know how to get along well. And now they're sharing space, usually maybe one or two square meters that they're sharing with another person while they're working 15 hour days, seven days a week under a lot of stress. And now you throw in a little bit of un 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 unacceptable sexual attention or drinking or drugs or, or an abusive captain or abusive head of department. And now you got a problem and there's no place to go. And so I hear the comments about they got a hotline they can call and they can talk to somebody. It's oh really, where are they gonna go on that boat to find a private quiet space? They're gonna go to the captain's cabin or maybe he's the guy, that's the, the root of the problem, or they're going to go to some other captain and, and have the department standing outside the door listening to the conversation. I, they, part of the problem that exists is there are no safe spaces on a lot of these boats. A lot of people tied into tight, comp, tight, tight areas, and there's just no way to get away from the stress and the emotion and all of that. And that needs to change. And it's not an easy change. A lot of these boats, and I've managed some of them, have just got no space for the crew. It just isn't. What's the solution? I, one of my clients has said, you got to get a bigger boat. But this boat you've got just won't accommodate more crew, and you can't create more space for the crew you got unless you put the crew in one of the guest staterooms. So culture, we have to go back and start at the very beginning to the yacht designers. I was at Monaco with Louis de Basto this fall. 
and he was showing a beautiful 90, 92 meter boat that he's designed. And I remember him telling me, Rick, this is so cool because, and this is a cool design, by the way, a lot of credit to Louis for this one. But all the engineering spaces are below the deck plates in the vessel because it's an all electric boat. So it's okay, you got 90, 92 meters of boat, now you just got rid of the engine room. What are you gonna do with that space? How about you take that space and don't give it to the owner. He's got a lot of space on this boat. Give it to the people that are going to spend most of their life on this boat. Create create a place for the crew to go. Create a quiet corner, soundproof room where a crew can sit down and have a conversation with a mental health provider if necessary, knowing he or she has got privacy and, and can have a candid conversation and can go back there as necessary to do it. Um, you start there and you get the designers thinking about things like that and the builders agreeing to support that type of thing and the brokers talking to the owners, the management companies talking to the owners and the captains talking to the owners and the owners going, oh, okay, yeah, I can do something to help this. It's a win-win eventually, but it's a long process. Long so it almost process. sounds like your vision is once again, bringing owner and crew together Have to, to create an industry that works for both of them in order to make them both happy going forward. Because my experience in yacht management has been, by and large, both are pretty fucking miserable. And that's sad. The two most important elements of our industry, owners and crew, and I don't want to say they make each other miserable, because I promise you, talking to the owners that I've spoken with and, and worked with, the last thing they want to do is make their crew miserable. And I don't think the crew intentionally wants to make the owner's experience miserable. But for instance, if you're a private charter boat and you're going, you're finishing a charter and nine hours later, the owners are coming back on board. That's not good. That doesn't work very well. You need time to turn the boat over. You need time for the crew to come down a little bit before the owner comes back on. And we had an owner doing that and didn't realize, just truly just didn't realize that he was having that impact on his crew. It just didn't occur to him. And after we had a conversation, we got him to promise as much as possible to give at least 48 hours. That's only two days, but that's better than what they were experiencing. So that was a situation where the crew was unhappy because of the circumstances created by the owner. The owner was clueless. Once the owner realized that his actions were actually creating stress and issues on his boat, he proactively made changes to try to improve it. So sometimes they just don't know, they don't get it. And then that's where the manager needs to intervene and say, hey, my dog in the fight is making everybody's happy. Everybody's happy as they can be, as comfortable as they can be, make the program work as best as it can work. And so I'll have a hard conversation with the owner, basically saying, shouldn't do this, prefer you not, can you change this and talk to the crew? And you need to be a little more vocal. You need to be willing to say, uh, we need a little more time, the captain particularly willing to go to the boss and say, hey boss, can you just cut us a little slack here? So those are small elements that come into play. But by and large, what I do see, at least here in the States, is owners that want a good program through that want to be part of a good program. It's getting the two together and figuring out all the fluffy stuff in between. Rick, I want to thank you so much for your time. And I think we should keep in touch and, and see how this process goes. And I do understand that you're looking at putting together some working groups and, and trying to figure out a way to move this forward in a positive manner that's going to work for both crew owner and, of course, the fluff in between. Absolutely. And I'm excited to do it. And I look forward to working with you on this, too, as well. Wonderful. Rick, this has been a pleasure. Rick Thomas, he is the president of Rick Thomas Yachting Development. We will be seeing more of him in the future. So please do tune in. You've been watching another edition of Yacht Crew Vlogs right here on Yachting International Radio. My name is Ria. I have been your host. We'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.